Hello, everyone, and welcome to RISE, Collaboration and Learning with International Trust Sites of Enslavement. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today, we're going to be talking about um, this exciting new collaboration known as RISE. So for anyone who joined us last year at Passport, you may have heard a little bit about this, but this will be your first time to fully get introduced to this exciting new program. So RISE means Reimagining International Sites of Enslavement, and it's a knowledge sharing program that brings together the leaders of historic sites with histories of slavery, slave trading, and in many cases, African self-emancipation efforts from around the Atlantic for critically needed professional development opportunities. RISE members were nominated to participate by one of four major cultural heritage and preservation organizations. They are the National Trust for Historic Preservation in the United States, the National Park Service, the Trustees of the Reservation, and the International Trust Organization, otherwise known as INTO. My name is Elon Cookley, and I am the Director of Interpretation and Education at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And I was able to um, help to start convening these sessions with uh, my colleague Alex at INTO. Um, starting in 2021. So starting in the spring of 2022, spring of this year, RISE participants had the wonderful opportunity to apply for funding to travel abroad in order to participate in professional development and knowledge sharing opportunities at a fellow RISE member site. So today we will actually be introducing you all to um, leaders from three of those RISE member sites who have come together for a really wonderful new collaboration. Those member sites are Fort Monroe in Virginia, a National Park Service site, the National Trust James Madison Montpelier, James Madison's Montpelier, also in Virginia, in the United States, and the International Trust Organization member, St. Lucia National Trust. And two of their staff had the wonderful chance to come and visit up in Virginia today. So I am going to introduce our panelists and they are going to share with us a little bit of information about their respective historic sites. First up, we have Elizabeth Chu, who is an art historian. She holds a BA from, uh, a bachelor's from Yale and a master's from the Courtauld Institute at the University of London and a PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. At Montpelier, she has overseen projects to complete the to pl complete the furnishing of the Madison House and to return slavery to the plantation landscape. You know, back where it always should have been. This includes the exhibition "The Mere Distinction of Color," and which is a winner of six national awards. She has also taught art history at the University of Virginia, the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, James Madison University. Wake Forest University and Davidson College, and has published and lectured widely on ways that art and architectural patronage relate to race, gender, and family politics. She currently serves as the interim president and chief executive officer at James Madison's Montpelier. Take it away, Elizabeth. So, as Elon mentioned, I am from James Madison's Montpelier, which is in a small rural community called Orange, Virginia about 90 miles south of Washington, D.C. Montpelier was the plantation of three generations of the family of President James Madison, the father of the U.S. Constitution, and it is where his family earned their wealth and status from the labor of over 300 men, women, and children that they held in slavery. This is a map that shows you the state of Virginia, the um, highlighted part is the, the Piedmont region where we are, just over the fall line. The orange shape is the county that we're in, called Orange County, and Montpelier is the pink star. So we're in sort of central Virginia in the Piedmont region. Uh, this was settled by migrating tobacco planters from the Tidewater beginning in the 1730s. This is when President Madison's grandparents established the plantation. The, the famous people, um, the, the, this is a presidential site belonging to a prominent person. These are um, James and Dolly Madison portraits by Gilbert Stewart, 
Um, Madison's known, as I said, as the father of the Constitution, and Dolly Madison as the inventor of the role of First Lady, as we still understand it today. Um, so Montpelier is, um, has in the last seven years done a lot, done extensive archaeological examination, documentary research, architectural, um, study, and we have, um, excavated and reconstructed six buildings right next to the main house, uh, created an exhibition. We're now working on a, a home farm site to the right off this slide. Uh, Montpelier is known in the field of historic plantation for the work that we've been doing for over 30 years with the descendants of those who are enslaved here. And in 2019, the descendants created their own organization, which is a separate 501c3, which is a co-equal organization to the Montpelier Foundation, which operates Montpelier in post stewardship with the National Trust. And um, in uh, just this past May, just a few months ago, the Montpelier Foundation Board and the um, Montpelier Descendants Committee, the, the organization, created a relationship of structural parity at the board level. So this is the first site where the descendants of the enslaved have shared equally in the governing of the sites. And we're now working on that structural parity at the staff level. <clears throat> So we are long um, prided ourselves on our balanced narrative of the American founding era. Um, and we refer to what we talk about here as whole truth history. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And I hope for everyone out there who is watching that um, as you are listening to all of the presentations that you please feel free to start putting your questions in the chat box uh, for our wonderful presenters. Next, we have, uh, we have the host of this particular collaboration, and that would be Yola Dance, who is an interdisciplinary public historian. She holds a bachelor's in history from Southern University a and College, a master's in historic preservation from Savannah College of Art and Design, and a certificate in environmental policy as a National Park Service fellow from the George Washington University. She currently is a PhD candidate at Howard University, studying 17th century slavery in US history and the African diaspora. Yola's research has focused on descendant community engagement, climate change adaptation, and the management of cultural resources in the Chesapeake Bay region. She's currently the superintendent at Fort Monroe National Monument, which is where several of our participants are coming from today. Thank you, go ahead, Yola. All right. Well, you know, first, just a huge thanks to um, the RISE um, working group um, for making it possible for us to be here together um, at Fort Monroe as we commemorate uh, African landing um, this weekend. Uh, and so I'll talk briefly um, just about an overview of Fort Monroe, um, and then I look forward to getting into the conversation um, so we can go to the next slide. Fort Monroe National Monument was established in 2011 by presidential proclamation. It was the first of the national park units established by President Barack Obama uh, using the Antiquities Act. Um, so in contrast to legislation, um, this uh, particular park unit was created by the President of the United States. Um, and so as uh, Elizabeth showed you um, the state of Virginia, we are the small little backwards Nike check um, at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and this becomes really important when you think of all periods of time. So Native American inhabitants, English settlement through 2011 and the uh, deactivation of Fort Monroe as an active army base. Uh, and you can go to the next slide. Um, we actually were established um, based on a number of periods of significance. Um, as I mentioned um, in the proclamation, um, we actually are significant uh, based on the inhabitants of the Kikitan peoples um, at the time of uh, contact with English settlers. Um, so as uh, Captain John Smith and others arrived in 1607, uh, their first interactions were with the Kikitan right here on the land 
um, known today as Fort Monroe in present day Hampton, Virginia. Um, th this particular place was named by Captain John Smith Point Comfort. Um, and so as you um, learn about the over 400 years of African-American life and history, 1619 is an event that took place here at Fort Monroe at Point Comfort, um, and you can actually visit the place where the history happened. What is also really important about Fort Monroe is that um, you were able to uh, learn about the evolution of slavery um, and between that 1619 event um, and the end of the Civil War, you actually have the 1861 contraband decision. Um, at that time, uh, you have three men, uh, Baker, Townsend, and Mallory, who arrive here and ask refuge during the American Civil War and are granted asylum. And that triggers a number of series uh, or a series of uh, legislative actions that result in um, uh, freedom seekers finding refuge, uh, the United States Colored Troop being established, as well as some of the language for the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment are all tied to these events. Uh, and so we refer to that um, particular history as the Arc of Freedom. So 1619 to 1865. What's so important about that is it, it creates the opportunity for us to have conversation um, both nationally and globally. Um, and we earned uh, inclusion in the UNESCO uh, sites of memory um, the, of the uh, Atlantic slave trade um, program. And if you go to the next slide, we are also one of the uh, many sites um, that interprets the Underground Railroad. Um, and so this particular slide that we see uh, really focuses on engaging communities where history happened. Uh, and a big part of what we've done is actually shifted emphasis. Um, and so most people would have heard of Fort Monroe as the place where Jefferson Davis was imprisoned during uh, or immediately following the um, American Civil War. Uh, and many of the uh, historical markers and memorials here are focused on uh, Confederate history. But if you go to the next slide, the work that we have been doing around enslavement, resistance and freedom has helped us to expand that narrative, um, not to dismiss it or not discuss it, but to really focus on it proper, properly and include the histories of others. And so we are a national Underground Railroad Network to Freedom site as well, which is a national site, uh, park service program that documents facilities, programs, and events of uh, freedom seeking, um, not only in the US, but abroad. Um, and so it's an incredible opportunity here at Fort Monroe to connect, um, and especially to connect with our uh, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yola. I'm sure we're gonna, when we get into the Q&A, we'll be talking a lot about the concept of freedom seekers and how exciting that is for historic sites to be bringing more attention to that particular experience. And uh, now I am happy to welcome Winston Fulgence, who will be introducing our third partner site today. Winston is a historical anthropologist. He holds a BA in history from the University of the West Indies, which is one of the most beautiful college campuses I've ever seen. And he has a master's in anthropology from the University of Florida. He completed a PhD in archeology span at the University of York in the United Kingdom, where his thesis was a comparative study of monuments to, com to commemorate slavery in the regions involved in transatlantic slavery and the slave trade. He has published several journal articles and book chapters on the role of history, cultural heritage, heritage management, and is currently the president of the St. Lucia Archaeological and Historical Society. And he is the Dean of Academic Affairs and head of the social sciences at the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College in St. Lucia. I would also like to quickly introduce Winston's colleague, Finola Jennings Clark, who is the business development and PR manager at St. Lucia National Trust. She will be joining us for today's conversation. And Winston, you can take it away. Thank you for <laughs> this wonderful introduction. Um, 
the site that we're focusing on is um, Mount Fortune. It's an old fort. It's a rather large site. I think it's one of the largest sites that the National Trust manages. And the importance of this site is that it is a military site. Currently, it's occupied by my college. It's South Lewis Community College. But a lot of the site still remains undeveloped. The issue with the site is that it is part of a, a meta-narrative. Um, so the first slide you're looking at here, Ruins of Mount Fortune. When people visit the site, they see the ruins or the, if you want to say, the architecture of old European military buildings. But there's a lot more to the site because the interpretation as European, as a European fort continues the message of Europeans. The site is a site in a country that is predominantly African descent, but that conversation never occurs when we visit different aspects of the site. Next slide, please. Okay, here's another example of interpretation. This is an old British um, cemetery where or, um, officers, governors, and so on are buried. The obelisk in, in, the, in the middle of it speaks to, well, actually imposes the European um, ideology layout and so on on the specific site. When you visit the site, you speak of the English. Next slide, please. This one is a little different, and it connects us, connects us directly to slavery. Why? Um, let's, um, let's do this differently. This one is going to go up to 1935 because this monument was actually installed in, 19, in the 1930s. It is actually a monument, an obelisk, to memorialize the Inskillen monument, um, Inskillen regiment, an Irish regiment, which actually won a, a battle in 1796 on this specific site. This battle ended what was called the Second Brigham War, in which enslaved Africans had freed themselves for almost four years. The island was important strategically, military strategically for the British. So they came in with 12,000 troops to invade the island and take over. The enslaved Africans understood that if the fort became, if the island became a British island once again, it would, they would be re-enslaved. So they fought and valiantly for about six months. But in May of, of 1796, the battle was lost, the war was lost, and the Enskillen uh, regiment became victorious. The reason I'm bringing this, for, uh, this, um, this obelisk, this monument up, is because the monument installs the memory of the European actors and colonizers on the space because when you visit the monument, it says nothing about the people who had been defeated and the people who became re-enslaved when this battle actually ended. So we're looking at trying to reinterpret the site to ensure that the history of the formerly enslaved Africans who fought valiantly to maintain their freedom is actually part of the interpretation on the site. Thank you. Thank you so much, Winston. I'm really excited for us to start digging into a little bit more about these sites. So my first question for everybody, can you talk a little bit about how your site engages with descendants of slavery? So that can include locals, Black diaspora tourists from all around the world, or individuals who are direct descendants from the people who were enslaved at your historic site. Let me first. <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, the staff at Montpelier has engaged with descendants of those enslaved here at Montpelier itself, but also on adjoining plantations who are most of the time relative to those who were enslaved here since the early 1990s. And we have shared research resources and collaborated on many, many programs on restoration projects, interpretation projects, um, exhibition projects. And um, that was always a very ad hoc sort of extractive process where Montpelier staff were gaining information and knowledge from descendants. 
And then, as I said earlier, in 2019, the descendants created their own organization. And just this last May, we um, created Parity. So we've made what was an ad hoc relationship, we've made it one of structural parity. Um, and this has made what we do here, almost since the beginning of the site, so much richer and more authentic and more relatable. Um, and I think more, more responsible and worthy. <clears throat> And we don't define descendant as just someone who can prove they have a DNA connection. Um, some people can, we know, some people know their, their descent. Most people do not, but know that their people were enslaved somewhere in this area. But we have, we have had members who actually don't, weren't enslaved anywhere near here, but still resonate with what we're doing and want to be part of it. And they are welcome as well. We do not, anyone is welcome. Thank you, Elizabeth. That's so important. That's so important. And um, we actually ascribe to the definition of descendant community that uh, your working group established as well. And it has helped to define how um, today we engage descendants. And so we use the um, descendant engagement rubric um, in uh, developing our partnerships. Um, I have to also give a shout out to the National Trust and Robert Newick. Um, as uh, Fort Monroe was being established in 2011, um, there was a um, contraband or um, I, I believe there, the name that they might have used was like a refugee working group um, that was brought together to help define how um, we should engage and work with descendants, um, which proved really important for organizations like the Contraband Historical Society. Um, who were the torch carriers before there was a national park unit, some of whom were descendants, some were not, um, but they came together in commitment around the history um, at a time when um, the uh, understanding of Baker Townsend and Mallory and their arrival during the Civil War was thought to be a myth. Um, so our work with uh, descendants have been around documentation, preservation, how to tell the stories and how to commemorate um, which informed our work with Project 1619, founded by Calvin Pearson. Um, and his work centered around uh, helping people to understand um, the distinction between Point Comfort and Jamestown, Point Comfort being the official port to Jamestown, but a very specific place in where uh, 20 and odd Africans landed in 1619. Um, so there were historical markers that were updated based on the research his organization did, including the marker here. Um, he also worked um, to plan for the 400 year commemoration in 2019. Um, and so there were state, um, city, as well as national commissions, ultimately that came together to do that work in coordination with descendants. Um, and um, currently we're working on a memorial um, our state partners, the Fort Monroe Authority, um, they are the lead on that project and we support with research um, and planning um, assistance. And um, this weekend we will be uh, doing a blessing of the land um, and uh, the Nansman Indian uh, Nation is uh, participating in that with us. So when we say descendant, we are actually talking about descendants of everyone on the landscape um, who were involved with one another and helped to shape America. Thank you. Anyone from our St. Lucia contingent want to share anything? <laughs> See, um, I can speak to the fact that when I mentioned the meta-narrative, which is very much European dominated, um, it's a large heritage site and consumption of that site is done mainly by European tourists, European North American tourists and North American tourists are of European descent. Um, um, engagement with an African descendant community is not one that is very, very large because the tourism market that we, um, that actually comes to St. Lucia is not one that is very African American or black British um, in origin. So actually it means that the narrative continues and what's being consumed is basically what's comfortable to most people who are actually engaging the site. 
Thank you. Could I quickly add? Sure. Um, so what might be interesting, and I mean, we haven't discussed this, but um, our tourism marketing um, organization is just establishing a diaspora marketing push. And at the same time, we're talking about community heritage tourism. So, you know, it might present an opportunity, especially with the support of organizations like these two that we're with today, um, who have more experience for us to start to leverage, you know, that, um, that new tourism recognition, because it's been there before, but it hasn't been recognized. And even in our tourism, it's, we've had up to 35 percent arrivals for stayover tourism from the Caribbean region itself. And so if, if people know what the islands are like, it's a, a long chain of islands, which have things in common, but we also, you know, are very distinct. So there is opportunity for tourism and there's opportunity for us to mold it in more healthy um, ways than, than what we have at the moment, which tends to commodify everything as something to be consumed in a very surface way um, for tourism, largely by people who look like me and have my origins. <laughs> Thank you, Vanola. I know if we had more time in this session, I, I think all three of your sites could really dig into the ways in which your sites has had to change in the last, you know, maybe the last couple of years or maybe the last even few months as you're kind of shifting your interest in, in engaging with uh, maybe mainly white visitors, white American or European visitors to how do we bring in more African descendants uh, visitors or indigenous visitors to our particular sites? What do we need to change in the marketing or the interpretation? Um, so if we have more time, I know we could like really get into that. Um, I just have one last question before we get into the Q&A. Um, if any of you would like to jump in and say something about your experience with the RISE program over the last year, has there been any particular you know, presentation um, from one of our working group meetings or a speaker or something that you've learned um, or something you would like to learn or gain from this collaboration, this international collaboration called RISE? I have to say, I mean, this is kind of embarrassing to admit, but the being attending these Zoom meetings with colleagues in the Caribbean in Africa has really helped me put what we're doing, you know, in this little place in the middle of nowhere, into this much larger international context, you know, African slave trade, middle passage context, and to see, you know, to to broaden our interpretation to include that acknowledgement. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's also in this kind of work so reaffirming to meet other colleagues who are doing similar things, who are way ahead in some ways, not so much in others, but we have so much to learn in talking to each other. And I remember, um, a, a presentation by a colleague in, um, in um oh god i'm gonna blank on the country where elmina castle is um, oh ghana ghana i'm so sorry uh someone from ghana just talking about those those absolutely um you know pivotal sites and i thought oh my god what we're doing here is obviously just the you know an outcome of what horror started there and that i think that's a really wonderful thing for the field I mean, even though we're talking about some of the worst things human beings ever did to one another, we do have a community and a shared experience in doing this, and we can all really benefit. But we can then teach our publics um, in a better way. Thank you. Yeah. We have maybe just one minute left. If, if anyone else wants to jump in and share anything about RISE, um, and then we'll go into the Q&A. Yeah, my thought is just that I echo um, Elizabeth's sentiments that there's this incredible opportunity to talk about our shared history, um, to look beyond the narrative of a slave story, but origins, um, how people contributed um, around the world to 
you know, uh, agriculture, economics, you know, you name it. Um, and then also, most importantly, the opportunities for healing, healing at the individual community um, level, as well as across cultures and communities. And so RISE has created, an, you know, that space where we talk about language, we talk about uh, connected stories. I mean, Elizabeth and I have been talking about James Madison uh, and his connection to Fort Monroe. Um, there's just so much that we can explore. Um, and that's, I mean, invaluable. Thank you, Yola.